Hi everyone. Here I'll give you a demonstration of creating a Jupyter Notebook in order to solve a problem from one of the assignments. If you don't know, haven't viewed the previous videos, please view them and create an account on Sage Math Cloud, log into that account, and create a new project and log into that project so you're at the pane where you can create a new file. Once you're here, you can click the Create button and type in the name of the file. This will be a solution for one of the problem sets. So I will call it 02 Solutions, and I want to use the Jupyter Notebook setting here. It'll take just a few moments to start the notebook and get it started. Once it's started, you should choose a kernel. Change the kernel down here to Anaconda Python 3. This will give you all the scientific computing stack. Uh, with Python 3. Another one that works quite well if you need Python 2 is to use the Ubuntu plane. Alright, so now we have a kernel started. Let's just check it. We can execute something to get a result. Okay. Uh, I'll restart this kernel. It was actually running from before. Now, once it's started, I'd like to document what I'm going to do. So I change the cell type to a markdown cell, give it a heading solutions for assignment 2. Then I should describe a little bit about what I'm doing. Here's the problem that I'm computing the solution for. Notice when I double click on a cell it allows me to edit it. And then when I shift enter it'll render it. So here's another markdown cell. And I'm just going to paste in some text I have from before. I've used some LaTeX here in order to get some math equations. And this is the question from the assignment. You're supposed to use a force law and an accelerated frame to compute the trajectory of a free particle. All right, I've worked out this problem, so I have my solution. Now, in order to do this, I'm using some keyboard shortcuts. They're listed up here, if you want to take a look at them. One of these shortcuts allows me to quickly change the type of cell from a markdown cell into a... Uh, it's from sorry from an input cell into a markdown cell so I've been doing that now I'm going to write the solution out here as LaTeX math so the transformation from one coordinate system to the other is uh, through complex numbers I'm going to use complex numbers to describe this problem in the plane and I need to define a new command here called vect takes one argument and types it as old faith math it's an arrow and I did something wrong there we go all right so here's the formal solution to my problem capital Z is in the rotating frame. I should make a note of that. All right, I've defined my coordinates and I have to reverse the rotation to go from the inertial frame to the rotating frame. Now, here's the force law, or rather the acceleration law. If there's no external force uh, in terms of the rotating frame. And so we have several pieces here. The first piece here is the is centrifugal piece. The second piece is the Coriolis piece. And the third piece arises when the omega has a time dependence. Now I have converted these into complex form by noting that whenever I have some omega cross z, I should pick up a factor of i. So the Coriolis piece here has an omega cross z dot, that becomes an i omega z dot. Factor of 2 remains. The first term here, the centrifugal term, has a negative omega cross omega cross z, so there's two factors of i, so it becomes positive. 
and the last term here retains its negative sign, uh, negative i dot. All right, so these are the equations that I think are correct, and I'd like to test them. So to do this, the first thing we want to tabulate a solution. So let's first create a solution here. Now, in order to get some numerical tools here, we have to import a library. So I will import numpy. Numpy is the numerical Python library uh, that has arrays and things like that. And I'm importing it as numpy, that's a, a NP rather, that's a very common thing to do. And then I can access various elements of it by going NP dot. Now, if you tab complete in the Jupyter Notebook, you will see all possible completions. That gives you some idea of what's going on. And uh, the command I'll use is lin space. It'll create a linearly spaced set of points, but if I didn't know that, I could put a question mark after it, shift enter, and it'll bring up the documentation string for that. So evenly spaced numbers at from start to stop, and this many of them. Okay, so I need to have a solution as a function of time. I'm going to go up to a time of one, one second or one unit. I'm going to start at an initial position, which is zero plus zero j. And I'm going to give it an initial velocity along the x-axis. So one plus zero j. I'm going to plot this at a hundred steps. All right, so now we can get our times using the linspace function. We're going to go from zero to t in a hundred steps. Let's just take a look at that. When executing things in a notebook, the last thing that you execute will be displayed, and there's my array, 100 points from 0 to 1. Okay, so those are my t's, and now I can get my z's, which is z0 plus v0 times t's. Let's take a look, those look good. All right, now I need to be able to convert those into the rotating frame. That's my z's, and for this I need to compute uh, the rotation using the exponential of negative 1j, that's the symbol for i in Python, times uh, the theta. Uh, but now I need to have some function that will return my thetas, so I'm going to define that function. This will allow me to change it in the future if I want to do something different. So get theta as a function of time. We need to have an acceleration. I'll give it a variable of one. And simply this is alpha times t squared divided by two. That is the solution up here for something with a theta as a function of t that's alpha of t, as was specified in the problem. Okay, so here we have my z's. And now I want to plot those. So if you want to plot things, you have to initialize plotting in the notebook. That can be done with the PyLab magic. And you want to specify that this is inline. That'll display the graphs in the notebook. If you are running this on your computer, you might want to do something else. For example, I quite often do PyLab OS X, which will display it in a separate window on my Macintosh. Uh, one other thing that's good practice is to go no import all. This will prevent Py the PyLab magic command, this one here, from overwriting a bunch of variables. It can be very convenient to drop the null import all. It'll import a bunch of things like signs and cosines and functions into your namespace. Uh, but ultimately, I suggest not working with it because it can create some problems. All right, so I have that. Now here, let's make a little plot. PLT is the prefix for plotting commands. Uh, to show you explicitly what that is happening, the PyLab command is doing the following from matplotlib, that's the Python plotting library, import pyplot as plt. That's where the plt symbol comes from. So now I can plot a simple thing. I want to plot the z's, the real part, and versus their imaginary part, the x and y components. And we'll see what that looks like. So here we go. We started at the origin uh, at time t equals 0. No, we sorry, we started at 1 at time t equals 0. 0 comma 1, and then in the rotating frame the particle starts moving, but we see this as going down. Now this doesn't look very good because um, 
the aspect ratio is very strange. Uh, we set the aspect ratio so I remember that I can get the current axis. I can go axis uh, aspect ratio. So in order to have complete, the AX object must actually be defined, so I had to shift enter the cell in order to get the axis. And then there is a set aspect ratio to one. Okay, so this is what the solution looks like in the rotating frame. It initially starts moving down, but is accelerating away. Now, does that make sense? Well, our initial particle should fly directly off to the right. If it were not moving, so if the velocity was zero, we should just have motion in a circle. Let's increase our time a little bit and see if that makes sense. Oh, that was a bit much. <clears throat> so yes, there we have motion in a circle. Now, if we add a small velocity to the right, We should see that our circle gets larger, but for some reason it's not. So, ah, I just plotted e to the negative theta t. I was not multiplying it by my initial solution. The transformation is z is this phase angle, the rotation matrix, times z. Let's call it that. So this is the rotation matrix. And now we see a spiral. That looks a little bit better. What if we change our velocity to make it negative? We should start moving towards the origin and then go out. Very small velocity, the spiral should be tighter. Hmm. Uh, we're starting at the origin, so the point sits at the origin. That's reasonable. And if we start outside, we get a finite radius. Ah, that makes more sense. Okay. And then if we get a very small velocity to the outside, we have a very tight spiral. So the reason we didn't notice that the spiral was tight before was due to the scale. Notice the, the vertical scale is not very large here. And the horizontal scale. All right, so we've set the aspect of the plot to 1. And we have a solution that we think is reasonable. Now, I'd like to test the formula that we have from above. Let me just copy it and put it below. So this is the formula we want to test. One way to test this is to numerically compute the derivatives. So we can do that using the numpy diff command. This will take the difference of all elements in an array. So we have our solution, which are the z's. We can compute the difference. We'll have to normalize that by dt, which is the difference in the times. And we just need one of those, so that's fine. So these are the velocities. However, one thing that's a little tricky is that the differences, when you difference, if you had a, an array of length 100, then it'll be an array of a length 99. It's defined at the midway points, as in any finite difference formula. And so I'm going to, for now, just put an underscore to indicate that that is only defined at those intermediate points. And I'll do it once more to get the second derivative, which will be defined again at the intermediate points of those. And I'll tabulate how everything at those intermediate points. So the times at those intermediate points are the original times, but we skip the first index and we skip the very last index. And we also want the velocities at those point, intermediate points, and so we're going to interpolate them. We're going to take the first to the end and add it to, from the beginning to the very, but not including the very last element. Minus one is an index into Python arrays that represents the uh, penultimate element. And I'm just going to average those two arrays before. That will create a linearly interpolation of the velocities. Okay, so now we have defined our arrays here. Let's just check that the shapes are okay. So uh, we also probably need the positions. 
So I can do those quite easily. The Zs at the intermediate positions are just the Zs at the original positions. Let's track it like that. Now let's check the shapes. So Zs dot shape. We see this is 98. It does not include either endpoint because we've tabulated it at just the central points, which is where the derivatives are defined. Okay, so numerically here I've computed a bunch of derivatives and I want to compare this formula up above, but in order to do that I need to be able to compute the derivative omega, which is the derivative of theta, and then alpha, or the derivative omega. So I'm going to go back to my original function and I'm going to provide it with the ability of computing derivatives. So if d is 0, I'll return the original function. Else, if d is 1, I'll return the first derivative. And the first derivative is alpha times t. Otherwise, if d is 2, I'll return the second derivative. Otherwise, the answer is 0. Now, I will use this function on arrays. And so I'd like it to return an array, but alpha is a number, so I will add to this 0 times t, just an array of zeros. And same thing with the last solution, sort of a shortcut. Okay, so now I have my get theta function, so I can now compute that. Thetas equal to get theta at t's. Uh, omega is the first derivative, and d omega is the second derivative. All right. Uh, we can plot these just to make sure that we're on the right track. So here are our times, and let's plot our theta as a function of time. So it's a parabola like expected. d theta should be a straight line. Uh, oops, d theta is omega. And d omega should be alpha, which is a constant in this particular case. And it was a value 1 we chose. Good, those look good. Now let's check this formula. So we're going to plot uh, the left hand side, which is manually computed as ddz. Okay, so there's our second derivative. Now, on the right-hand side, let's slowly add the terms and see what the acceleration is. So, we should have minus 1j times d omega plus omega squared times z minus 2j two, two times omega times dz. Let's try executing it, make sure it works. Now let's plot the exact solution. dds exact dot real ddzs exact dot image. And they almost sit on top of each other. The slight deviation here is probably because we have only chosen 100 steps, so the finite difference method has some errors. We can just try increasing that up to 1,000, and you see they lie right on top of each other. So we've now numerically verified that this equation indeed describes the solution to our problem. Let me quickly review what we've learned here. We've used the pilot, percent pylab magic inline function so that we can plot. We've then imported some modules, in particular the plotting module and the numpy module. Strictly speaking, these two lines are not needed because the pylab line imports both of those, but I'll include them here to be explicit. We've then set up our initial position as a complex number, our initial velocity as a complex number, our final time, how many steps we're going to use, we created the times as linearly spaced points from 0 to t, steps, points. We've created the, now the solution to the problem in the inertial frame, which is z0 plus v0 times t. We then defined a function that would return the angle as a function of time or its various derivatives. 
and then we designed the rotation matrix that rotates us from the inertial frame into the rotating frame. That's why we have a minus i theta here. Then we computed the solution in the inertial in the rotating frame rather by applying this rotation matrix to the inertial solution, and we plotted those. We then got the current axis. That's what this GCA function does, and we set the aspect ratio to one so that circles look like circles. We then went and computed the numerical derivatives of various quantities. We computed the derivative of z and the derivative of dz to get the second derivative. We had to expand these, uh, manipulate these rays slightly so that they were all aligned at the same grid points. Every time you take a difference, you reduce the dimension by one, and it's defined at the midpoints of the previous interval. We did this twice to get the second derivative, so we were defined at the first skipping the first and last index in the arrays. And then we computed the thetas and the derivatives. And finally, we plotted the numerical derivative of the acceleration, the real and imaginary components, against the exact solution, which comes from the right-hand side of this formula, the force law in that equation. And we see that the solutions match. Save our book, notebook, and go forth from there.